Good afternoon. Um, I'm Professor Alison Noble from the Institute of Biomedical Engineering and I'm delighted to welcome you all to the fourth lecture in Biomedical Engineering sponsored by Medtronics. Um, I'm particularly delighted to welcome um, Leo Pretzis today who's representing um, Medtronics and I'll invite him to say a few words in um, a few minutes. Um, but before I start, I've got to do the boring, most important parts. So can I ask everybody to please um, switch off your mobiles? And I've also been asked to point out where the fire exits are. There is one fire exit here and two at the back. Um, so I'd like to now hand over to Leo um, to say a few words. Thank you, Alison. Yes, well, I've been leaving the professors and allowed to speak for two minutes to you, so I'm going to try to stick to that. Um, I'm honored to be here in Oxford, at, uh, one of the oldest centers of university in the world, and still very well known across the world, for that matter. Biomedical engineering in itself is the basis of our company, I might say. Our founder, Earl Buckley, was a medical engineer who more than 50 years ago applied his knowledge to contribute to human welfare through the application of what we now call biomedical engineering. As such, I think you can value that still today, for a company like ours, and <coughs> many other companies also, the fact that biomedical engineering gets this attention is very important. If you look at our products, medical devices, very uh, state-of-the-art medical devices, a lot of technology is in there. Innovation can only be done when we go cross-functional, cross-groups. We need to work together with all disciplines, but we also need to work together and be able to work together with the physicians in order to innovate our products. And therefore, I'm also glad that we at Metronics still have the room through our foundation and many other efforts to partner with academia and to support scholarships and lectures like this one. And with that, I, I hope you will enjoy this year's lecture by Professor Duncan, and I give back to you, Alison. Thank you So now it's, it's my, my pleasure to introduce the speaker today, um, Professor Jim Duncan. Um, Jim is the Ebenezer K. Hunt Professor of Biomedical Engineering as well as a Professor of Diagnostic Radiology and Electrical Eng Engineering at Yale University. Jim and I have known each other for about 20, 20 years. Um, I first visited Yale sort of in the early 90s when I was working for GE. And medical image analysis, which is the topic today, also my own research area, was very young at that time. It was basically a, a, an early side shoot of computer vision and image processing. And there were a, a few meetings that were attached to the main, main um, conferences. There were no journals. Um, and it really wasn't a, a, an established discipline on its own. And um, Jim has been one of the very influential figures in taking, taking the field from its very young, young days to where it is, is, is today. Um, to give a bit of background, um, Jim has um, gained his PhD in 1972 from the University of South California and then spent 10 years working for his aircraft company before joining Yale faculty in 1983. Jim will today be talking about um, his, his, the subject is model-based strategies for biomedical image analysis and he has been a, a leading force in developing that um, area of our, of our research field. He's published many highly cited papers in the area and in 2008 was awarded the MICI 2008 Significant Researcher Award for recognition of his um, pioneer, pioneering research in that area. He's a fellow of the IEEE, um, IEEE, a fellow of the American Institute for Biomedical and Biological Engineering, and also a fellow of, of the, the MICI Society, which is the society in my field. In addition to his individual contributions, um, Jim has um, played a key role in developing bioengineering at Yale, um, both in research and academic programs. And it was um, yesterday uh, we had um, the lunch with the Vice Chancellor. We had some very interesting discussions of differences between the two. Um, and a, a link between Jim and, and Oxford is the fact that um, when the Vice Chancellor was at Yale, he was worked very closely with Jim in developing bioengineering there. 
Um, Jim has also contributed to the development and shaping of the biomedical image analysis community, as I've already mentioned. And about every time I meet him, he's been chairing some very important committee in Europe or US that's been reviewing um, a program of some kind or a major grant. Um, he's chaired most, if not all, the key conferences in our field. He's the current, of, current president of the Mikai Society and is the co-founder and current co-editor-in-chief of a journal um, called Medical Image Analysis, which is published by Elsevier, but was originally published by ONUP, so again, as a second of the UK. So with this introduction, I would um, like to hand over to Professor Jim Dunham to give the floor to from this lesson. Well, it's my pleasure to be here, <clears throat> and uh, thanks to Medtronic for sponsoring this and the Oxford Engineering Sciences Department, especially uh, Allison and Julia for having me here. It's a real pleasure. Uh, I've known Allison for quite a while and uh, Mike Brady before that, and uh, I think I remember my first memory of Oxford was uh, when we started this journal with OUP and uh, having a Lafroig in Mike Brady's house, I think, somewhere near here, so it was uh, quite enjoyable. <laughs> Um, so today I'd like to uh, talk to you about um, work in this area of biomedical image analysis, specifically model-based strategies. I try to. I hope there's something for everybody in the audience at different levels. It's sort of uh, the the area uh, talks across uh, different applications, or I'll try to talk across different applications, different medical imaging modalities, with the emphasis on using applied mathematical techniques, really out of. Uh, areas in biomedical, electrical engineering, computer science to uh, try to analyze information in these data sets. So I'll start out by um, trying to introduce my idea of model-based analysis first, then look at different problem areas. First, geometrical uh, models and how they might be used and have been used by our group. Uh, especially for segmenting structure from images, integrating functional ideas into uh, structural information like an fMRI and even some motion analysis at the cellular level. And, and I'll try to, while most of this will be at millimeter scale imaging like MRI, organ level imaging, uh, ultrasound of the body, I'll have a little bit about uh, cellular biology and a new interest of mine at the microscopy level. And then uh, fi finally end up with ideas on physical models, more biomechanics driven models in particular to help constrain recovery of information from images and then sum up with some ideas on our challenges in the field. So I would start by saying that in general, uh, human experts that deal with images in the, in the biomedical community really use models implicitly to somehow analyze usually qualitative information from images. So if there's a 3D stack of images of the human brain, a neuroradiologist would try to get out some information, making hopefully rational decisions about where is a tumor, what is that, what's the structure of that person's brain, how might they diagnose disease. And people I work with, uh, a neuroradiologist in particular, they bring ex their experience to constrain those decision making, that decision making, if you will. Prior experience looking at images, they might know what a tumor looks like, hopefully, in their training. They might also, one of the folks I work with has done mammalian brain resection, so he looks at fibrous structure in the brain and brings that actual uh, sort of uh, histopathology, uh, whoops, to the problem. Sorry about that. And there's my one bottle of water flowing <laughs> from. And, uh, and so uh, I think that in a sense, the automated image analysis systems are really trying to go after the same thing in a way, um, where we start with a stack of images, and we're trying to get out in a reproducible and accurate, hopefully, uh, an automatic way, quantitative information from images that is useful in understanding different biomedical problems, perhaps diagnosing disease, perhaps simply understanding something about biology. And we would then maybe start with some kind of a, let's say, dense analysis of these images and go through some kind of mathematical decision maker, usually some kind of optimization strategy or statistical decision maker, to get out parameters that describe heart disease or size of things in the brain or how are cells moving in a, some sort of a, a, uh, an image sequence. 
And we, these are, tend to be ill-posed problems. Noise and blur and degradations in the image cause this to be, you might get some hints of where an object is, but there might be a variety of solutions of how to connect the dots and find some boundary, for instance. So we bring models to bear to try to constrain this recovery situation and sort of play data and model together in order to come up with a, a, a well-posed mathematical solution that hopefully makes sense in the particular problem domain. So what are the kinds of models used? Well, things you, I'm sure when you saw the talk title, you probably came to mind. Size and shape of anatomical structure might be one, uh, and maybe of abnormal structure, what do tumors or, or some abnormalities look like. Maybe uh, something about uh, how is functional information, for instance, information about motion or time series information from a functional MRI data set, how coherent is it spatially or temporally? That's a model implicitly. Or how, what about the deformation characteristics of different normal and disease states, for instance, in the heart? And we'll talk about this a little bit. Where do useful models come from? Typically, geometry or some kind of shape-based processing is one. Uh, maybe functional relationships or actual the physics of the underlying uh, um, um, physiological or biological situation as well as from the imaging, image acquisition modality. And in the biomedical world, we tend to be guided by anatomy, physiology, biology naturally. So that is hopefully in the modeling as well. So let's look at a set of these. Uh, first, starting with uh, one of my original favorite problems, which is segmenting structure and using geometric models to help constrain this. And this is a not so easy task, as many I know in the uh, image analysis group with Allison and Julia. I, I saw some of your work, and you, you were uh, sort of ch challenged by these same problems. Even if I give you an image of this, a pretty simple image, a white object on a gray background, and ask everyone in the room to trace the boundary on that with a cursor, well, it would turn out that that's not so easy to do in a completely reproducible fashion. It's even more difficult if I add noise to that artificial image and blur out part of the object. And so, <clears throat> for instance, uh, these might be a set of tracings from four or five people, and it's, it's pretty good, it's pretty close, but there's just enough variation in what you would try to do manually that it would uh, come up like that. And same thing, the more, uh, only dif more difficult when there's noise, blur, et cetera. So, the first problem is how can we constrain that? And the idea is to use a range of training information about the, sh the, the previously seen shape of that to help constrain the recovery of that object in a difficult image. So we posed this problem in this way early on. Uh, it was back in the 90s, uh, 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 other groups, specifically Dmitry Trizopoulos and colleagues, had been looking at something called snakes that maybe you've all heard of. We were in the game around the same time, only trying to look at biological objects. And we said, well, let's pose the problem as a map estimation, maximum a posterior estimation, where we're really looking for the probability of some parameterized template given image data turned it around with Bayes' rule, ended up with a likelihood term and a prior term. The likelihood term is you could be derived from your favorite image feature. With, we uh, popular at that time and still somewhat is looking for local um, grayscale derivatives or changes, edges essentially. And so the likelihood term is based on that feature information, for instance, something like this from a 2D brain image. And then the template we parameterize as a closed contour, uh, parameterize it in a particular way, Larry Stabe and I, and uh, so this thought of it as a signal, as, as a closed um, uh, two-dimensional signal of XY coordinates that we could think of by uh, parameterizing it using a Fourier transform and just take a transform of this uh, contour space and simplify the problem from, a, a, let's say, 300 XY coordinates to harmonics, each of which you could represent geometrically actually as an ellipse as this planet system where this spins around this and this spins around that. And so three harmonics, each with only three parameters, major and minor axis uh, length, overall um, phase and the, uh, of the point and the overall sort of uh, angle of the, of the ellipse. So with just 12 parameters, we could capture lots of contours and then have somebody trace examples uh, of we've seen this part of the brain before, perhaps the ventricles, save up 
those closed shapes in the template and now have an incoming test image and look for the same object in that, playing off the, the extracted uh, features, looking for that object in the image against this prior uh, database that we store up shape information in. So in the simplest problem here, or one of the, the problems we looked at, Here's three slices through a, a cardiac CT, Cine CT single frame. You see, you st initialize it with an ellipsoid, and the priors are saved up on sort of ellipsoidal like uh, shapes of this endocardial surface of the left ventricle. And in maybe, well, back then, maybe 10, 15 minutes, it would deform itself, again, playing against this sort of collection of standard shapes in a statistical distribution as a prior, and match the edge information, and it worked reasonably well on a collection of objects as long as it was a closed uh, convex typically shape. And it, we applied it to everything we could find our hands, get our hands on really, uh, brain images, heart images, uh, cells, what have you, and it had this flavor of incorporating uh, models into solving the problem. Well, the next level of complication was we, we had uh, problems specifically working with epilepsy neurosurgeons where we needed to find collections of objects, subcortical gray matter from T1 weighted uh, MR images. And sometimes these objects ran into each other and kind of were mushy and sort of uh, not clear how to uh, sort of define the boundaries. And so we were looking for something that could localize local deformable collections of shapes, almost like a local deformable template, things like the hippocampus and the amygdala that run together. And the idea was to seed several points, probably automatically, although some of these were done manually, this one I think initially, and then evolve out these objects that sort of preserve self-shape but communicate with each other in terms of how close they are uh, and what their neighbor object shape is. So we could uh, sort of uh, run this in several minutes, hopefully, as the computers were getting faster, and we could find these local objects reproducibly, and then use these as a guide for, in this case, for epilepsy neurosurgery to help guide where they were going to do certain uh, um, planning and resections and maybe deep brain stimulation in certain cases. So we set this up again as our favorite decision-making strategies, uh, maximum or map estimation, and looking for a single deformable surface by um, maximizing over a joint distribution of a collection of neighboring objects, surfaces, uh, given the image data. Turn it around again and drop the denominator. We have a likelihood term that's matching image gray level values, a little bit different than edges this time. We really look for an average intensity on either side of the evolving contour, and then have a prior term that was over the collection of prior shapes uh, of the local objects and how they interrelate. The parameterization this time was chosen a little bit different. Perhaps some of you know this level set idea. Um, it uh, basically says, okay, for any closed contour, we'll have a, a sign distance map negative inside and positive outside that kind of looks like this. It gives you a dense matrix of values of distances and that parameterizes any, surf, any closed contour, closed surface. And you could then uh, use that as the parameterization. It's a little denser, but it's a little more robust to noise and is an interesting different uh, approach to parameterizing objects. And the, so the likelihood term was simply this sort of uh, local look on either side of the contour in the image set of what the intensities were to match some reasonable uh, uh, intensities for that object. The prior term is a little difficult to deal with in terms of a joint density distribution. And we got away with sort of saying, well, let's anchor it to each object that we're looking at. So if the triangle's the search object, any neighboring objects will be anchored to that. We can treat them as independent in this case, so we get a set of conditional probabilities that we can multiply by each other, and then say, okay, anchored to S1, we'll look at each of the neighbors. And then it, there's a self-shaped term at the end of it as well. These level sets uh, then can be looked at for the object self-shape in terms of the amygdala, the mean and modes, uh, and the left hippocampus relative to the amygdala. By subtracting the level sets, this gave us an approximation to these conditional density functions. So this is all um, sort of a uh, uh, little tricky. This parameterization isn't, uh, for those of you uh, familiar with these sort of trying to create shape spaces and manifolds, not totally a linear vector space, 
but we could kind of approximate it uh, in this space and it seemed to work okay in comparison to point sets. This is the worst math slide for any of you that aren't too thrilled with the math in the talk, but I'll, uh, I thought it, uh, at least one with some uh, real meat in it would be worth knowing. So. Um, but anyway, uh, the idea is that we would take the self-object collections of a training set, their level sets, and do a, a, a dimensionality reduction using principal component analysis, take the differences of the level sets and uh, use this as the neighboring priors anchored to the object, again, reduced with PCA. And it's all set up as a map estimation again. If you can follow through this for those interested, that you assume each one is a Gaussian distribution, take the log of it. This gives you a functional, right, an energy function whose solution is a function, the level sets. Then using calculus of variations, write down an Euler expression, and that becomes an evolving differential equation for each object that could be solved again, and not really just a few minutes. The idea is that, but really intuitively, this reduces to a set of model constraints, a regularizing term spatially, the uh, adherence to the image gray level values, this is the data in the test set, and then the shape prior distribution and the neighbor prior distribution. So you're trying to evolve out this object, match the appropriate intensities, but be constrained by looking at these uh, self shapes and how that shape as it evolves relates to any neighboring shapes. More pictorially, if you seed uh, four or however many objects you want in the image, you can watch the whole procedure evolve and, uh, and see these. For instance, here's uh, the amygdala and the hippocampi uh, each evolving together and uh, kind of not going beyond their inappropriate boundaries as they merge into each other. And so here it is embedded in the image. You see the objects and their shapes evolving out with this sort of key slide is this, I think, sagittal slice where you're seeing that the, it preserved uh, uh, its, its sense of a boundary between the two objects that isn't easy, actually. And so in the best gold standard we had, it was sort of tracing by uh, neuroradiologist experts, and we could come within a, a sort of a voxel resolution, a millimeter cubed of their uh, estimates approximately over 12 subjects using a sort of a leave one out strategy where 11 of the subjects were priors for the other subject and rotating through. So, um, so there's a sort of a, a taxonomy of looking at object self-shape, object interacting shapes as geometric models to find objects. One other challenge in this area was to um, try to look for, uh, we, we had a variety of problems both at the, uh, corti uh, at the millimeter scale level to look for cortical gray matter in conjunction with these epilepsy projects and also had a variety of membrane problems even at the cellular level where you try to look for two surfaces that are loosely coupled to each other and in the same uh, three-dimensional data set. So we posed this problem a while back in a, a little bit different way. Basically, these are uh, evolution equations or speed evolution equations, differential equations for, the, again, the level sets representing uh, an inner and an outer object. In this case, the inner object was the white uh, gray matter boundary, and the outer object was the gray matter CSF uh, object boundary. And we, we said, let's evolve, the, let's seed these at surfaces, let them grow out with this evolution equation, but stop it with a, feed, a speed term when it gets near desirable intensity values of gray-white on the inner one, gray CSF on the outer one. But couple in there a term that said, okay, as you evolve everywhere, you've got to look out and see this evolving what really is a mesh and stay coupled to your partner mesh as you evolve out. So this kind of problem looked like this. You see uh, a few points inside the white matter, uh, three shown in that, but really six in this solution. And the yellow uh, ball, the balls start evolving out, trying to match uh, the appropriate gray level information and uh, coupled to the partner surface. So the yellow balls evolved inside the magenta. And uh, it did a pretty good job. And actually, it's pretty tough to get that outer surface to pull some of those uh, cortical grooves down in from the uh, outer pile surface. 
And uh, this was used in a variety of neurosurgery uh, uh, and other applications. And the state of the art at that time was literally, I think it was David McDonald up at McGill, and they took them 24 hours to run this. I don't know how they were doing it, but, and I'm not, well, anyway, we got it down to 15 minutes, so something was off somewhere. But it was really uh, working pretty well. And uh, we, we've really uh, continued to use this in some of our uh, projects. And in fact, uh, validated on the midbrain uh, volumes to try to look at uh, expert tracings over uh, as much as we could get them to bear uh, the neuroradiologists um, against the algorithm. And did pretty well in terms of, uh, well, these are 14 data sets and the true positive brain volumes were in the mid 90s, 90% 90 uh, overlap accuracy, not too bad with voxels that were false positives. And the cortical strips a little bit worse, but still in the high 80% overlap range. So once you get geometric structure, uh, let's say in the brain or the heart or what have you, uh, useful for all kinds of applications, not just uh, measuring size and shape of objects. Uh, in the brain in particular, if you have this cortical layer, you can immediately have a measure for cortical thickness that's in very interesting in a whole variety of applications in, in neurological, uh, di neurodegenerative disease. Also, as you'll see in a second, you can use it as a constraint to look for other functional information because things like fMRI should only activate in typically gray matter regions, so it's useful in that domain. It could be part of an image registration process. You can run these geometric models, do segmentations, use the segmentations as one, at least one constraint for matching uh, three-dimensional data sets. And while I won't go into it, my colleague Larry Stabe is working in this area at our place and others all over uh, internationally. If you have a different kind of MR data, you can also use geometric tubular, like curvilinear constraints, to pull out things like white matter tracks in the brain. And uh, you'll see, I'm going to put this together with something else, so I just mentioned it here. But the same, the same idea of some kind of an energy function with a geometric constraint to track over, in this case, uh, diffusion weighted features you can pull out geometrically guided structural information there as well. So I'm going to, so that's sort of a, a quick look at a, a variety of problems in the ge geometry-based modeling. I'd like to turn now to ideas that I'll call functional modeling or, or analysis of functional data with an integration of functional and structural information. In the first place I'll go, this was uh, related to a particular project that we've been working on uh, with our child psychiatrists at Yale and the Child Study Center, trying to look at autistic children using functional MRI data. And the first level of analysis is to um, Really, the, I, I won't go through the entire idea, but some of you I know out there know this, but I, uh, you basically collect a, a series of, temp, uh, of temporal image uh, information sets while having a person in the magnet and giving them these uh, sort of on-off tasks, block design tasks, where they're uh, seeing some kind of an object, in this case a biological object and an inanimate object in some sort of 25 second intervals, and then you record this time series of, of uh, images and then take this fMRI time series, realign it and register it to structural information, normalize it perhaps to some template, for instance, the uh, Montreal template, um, <clears throat> and then call this functional data and match it typically in the fMRI world to this design matrix that represents when the different tasks are turned on and off in the time sequence, as well as some other confusion parameters that you might know about noise. And basically match the time series data to this X design matrix and get out regression parameters that say how well the, each voxel of the time series data matches your block design on tasks. So the, <coughs> the thing we did here a little bit differently was to bring geometric information about where gray matter was and also to say that we'd like to put priors now, here's the model, of prior information about how normal children activate to these particular tasks. And the task we were looking at first was faces versus houses. And we knew we were looking at only one part of the brain, knew roughly what we were looking at in terms of where the activation parameters would lie, and so built in a training set into this whole idea. And, and then estimate a new sort of uh, 
regression parameters, but now really map estimated regression parameters. So here's the task, um, <clears throat> the initial task. It's uh, in something like 25 second blocks. The young adults, young male adults were shown faces, houses, faces, houses with some rest in between. It was known to stimulate the fusiform face area on the fusiform gyrus if they saw these biological facial objects. And there's another area known as the parahippocampal uh, place area that was also to be uh, stimulated and see activation in that. So using just uh, sort of early forms of this approach, we could get out that in normal young adult males, this face region lit up nicely and the, and the place region as well. But interestingly, in a, in a collection of uh, 14 autism subjects, young adult males, there was no activation to the facial uh, um, uh, uh, stimuli. Basically, they saw faces and houses as the same thing. There was simply no change. So with that as the underlying task, that's where we were going with this work. But the, we wanted to get better, and one of the key problems were, was that the, the children, especially the autistic children, by, by the time you do, um, you, you need multiple runs of these. Each run takes about five to seven minutes. And to build up a decent uh, collection of data, these activation tasks, you might need 35, 40 minutes of data. Very difficult for children in general. I'm sure if any of you would have kids would agree to sit in a magnet for that long anyway. And for these autistic kids, it's especially challenging. So what we were after, could we use model-based strategies to get after something that you might get out of five runs from a single run augmented by the model? So what we did was um, we had ground truth, and this is sort of at a, a slice about here, just looking at the parahippocampal uh, stimulated area. If you did one run of the normal general linear model analysis, you get something like this. If you did spatial smoothing and just the gray matter prior like this, with this combined sort of structure function prior, we're able to get closer and, and actually pretty acceptable data uh, related to the five-run gold standard. So we're able to go after these kinds of ideas on a number of subjects and reduce the time that they might need to be in the magnet. This work, uh, and so, and did some, at least, uh, kind of the standard um, attempts at matching uh, the five run to the one run plus model data to show that some of squares and correlation coefficient metrics at least were improved over the general GLM case and some of the other attempts at spatial smoothing. The, um, I got more and more into this project, and, and I, I have to say it's pretty interesting, and uh, the, where the neuroscientists are going now, uh, as perhaps any of you working in the fMRI data uh, area know, are towards looking at brain networks and how does not only a single region activate, but how do they activate in unison to certain tasks. Our child psychiatrists and neuroscientists uh, studied uh, using sort of anatomically small seated uh, areas over a number of uh, relevant regions and try uh, hypothesize and ultimately validated in at least some initial run on about 100 subjects that they thought they saw about six areas lighting up that were connected in a two, two, and three subnetwork, uh, at least in the normal child. And it seemed to be disrupted in the autistic child. But this was very tedious analysis. Um, they really just had small spherical circular regions in these anatomically seated zones. So we, th we thought this was a pretty interesting problem. Uh, many in the fMRI area are looking at sort of correlating and connecting regions everywhere. Um, we thought, let's focus on some specific ones that they were hypothesizing as subnetworks related to specific biological processing tasks of, you'll see, a biological versus scrambled motion. So the, uh, the three networks are these uh, different regions, subcortical regions and cortical regions of the brain. I won't read all the, the terminology, but uh, basically uh, amygdala fusiform was one having to do with emotion, uh, another one related to high level observation, and then another one, a three-way network about specific action. Um, the, I, I just really less to focus on the neuroscience and a little more on, the, on what we were thinking about methodologically here is that we had the idea that uh, 
we, we wanted to try to look for reinforced strong local subnetworks in the brain related to this processing. So this two, two, and three combination of these subnetworks that they defined, the, the, the child psychiatrists defined as the social brain related to autism, with the idea of finding these regions in normal kids as well as autistic kids and looking for processing deficits in the subnetworks, which they had some evidence of in a sort of a brute force way. So we went to, uh, this was a particular uh, PhD student that had come out of some, with some interesting math background. We looked to the machine uh, learning area and found some work uh, back in the 90s on ideas of co-training and applied it here with the idea that we were looking for to group functional information, sort of cluster time series within local regions, look that it correlates to a, one of these distant regions, but then reinforce it with any structural connections between those functionally evolving zones and the, using DTI data. So we said, all right, out of this, there was some work in something called co-training that actually looked at ideas of taking multiple different disparate views of information and using it together in a decision-making process to try to locate information in a, in a collection of data. They use it for postal codes. But the idea here is that we would take the fMRI data and then have a, a DTI or a, a, a white matter diffusion weighted image, collection of images on the same patient and put it together in this multi-view uh, strategy that was based on an expectation maximization algorithm that I'll describe in a second. The expectation step tries to cluster or assign the voxels uh, a, a, a value or a, one of the subnetwork values to one of the subnetworks. And then in the next iteration, as the network evolves out, it re-estimates the statistics of probability of that subnetwork for that voxel and then reiterates the process. At the end of the day, we find a collection of functionally evolving regions reinforced by white matter connections in between them. Here's the block diagram of the algorithm. And I basically, let me try to explain it a little more intuitively. You seed each region. You could do it anatomically in the middle of the region in the fMRI data set with a sphere. You collect time series statistics within those spheres. They're nearby the regional zones that we hypothesize. And then you correlate those within, uh, in and around that region and, and with any distant region with the idea of not fixing where the functional activation region is, but growing out and recruiting gray matter of reasonably uh, like time series that correlate to another distant region. And then as you get that, you, throw, you look in the DTI data set and look for uh, tractography that's already been run and underlying fractional uh, directionality, fractional anisotropy values that reinforce those two regions. So you seed up here, compute the separate functional and uh, DTI-based likelihoods, recombine them with this, estimate the new evolved functional zone, fit parameters to those statistics in the maximization step and then pass them back to the next iteration of growing out these functional regions. The tasks given to these subjects in 25 second increments were this biological motion task due to this light pattern, kind of an interesting idea here, uh, and then the scramble motion task. And so these were done, this was now back to the I think seven minute runs of about five of them to uh, look at these in a on off zone having the, the person in the magnet. So we've, this is early work. We've done some initial work in here. Um, and here's what we've been getting. And we just looked at two of the subnetworks and a background class at the same time on five normal children. And here you can see the idea here, perhaps, that the uh, red and pink with the yellow in interconnections are the STS and uh, IFG. Um, uh, if, for those of you that know what that is, inferior temporal, in, uh, inferior frontal gyrus and superior temporal sulcus, and then the amygdala and fusiform in the uh, blue and green with the green interconnections, I think. Interest, strikingly, although different size functional regions in each subject, basically lying in similar zones and reinforced by this. And we could find clusters of, uh, that over these five subjects, that the same, if you looked in the probabilities of membership, that it was pretty high in three or four of the subjects without confusing the background. These are sort of group probabilities of the analyzed regions and could compare them uh, pretty well across the five subjects. 
But now we, the, we're just starting on this next part, but we did a group analysis where all five subjects in each of an a normal class and an autistic group were run together. So now you're trying to evolve and group collections of these time series over multiple patients all at once and reinforcing by the DTI uh, directionality. And so for over the groups, we were interestingly able to find that the three-way network, just looking for two networks, we found pretty strong evidence of higher in the normal group than the autistic group in terms of class membership. And we didn't find such strong membership or, d d let's say, differentiation in this amygdala fusiform gyrus, but the amygdala alone was activate, or was uh, sort of uh, clustering together better than that in the normal group than the autistic group. So some interesting ideas about this sub-network grouping that we're, we're sort of moving ahead on. And so all of this was now uh, sort of a different kind of modeling, uh, really coherence across functional time series, trying to sort of group things together in this uh, sort of co-training multiple view reasoning strategy. Now another, the, the second kind of functional modeling, if you will, was uh, a completely different scale and I thought it would be fun to include this in the talk. It's a new area I'm quite interested in. It's working with cell biologists. A uh, whole new world for me. I used to working with neurosurgeons and radiologists and, uh, it, and over the, uh, the um, cocktail hour I have all kinds of stories of <laughs> working, as many of you probably do, with cross different kinds of collaborations. But this is a problem, uh, pretty interesting, a whole new uh, uh, sort of scale of imaging and a, a different kind of problem. I work with Pietro Di Camilli, he's a, a cell biologist, working on problems of endocytosis, trying to look at subcellular vesicle trafficking between cells. This is a problem where uh, a, a small lipid vesicle impinges on the plasma membrane of a cell, invaginates the wall, is coated with clathrin, breaks off and traffics in the cell to some inner endosome. And it's a way cells communicate. Uh, if there's a wounding of the cell, it has some problems. Uh, any of you that are, know biology probably better than me, uh, it's a way viruses sometimes invade cells. The, the imaging modality they use is a, is a very high res, they're trying to look at live cell imaging. So live cell in this case means harvesting, harvesting a particular cell, putting on a microscope slide. It's been genetically altered in different ways to have green fluorescing proteins embedded in the vesicles and or the plasma membrane and the microtubules. And you're trying to analyze this information by sending in a laser light at a certain, so here's the slide and the cells on the slide. And, a, a la and, this, and the technique they use is called total internal reflectance microscopy. And what it's after is uh, stimulating with an evanescent wave by a, by a laser light the, the slide in a certain way to stimulate this particular wavelength or color of GFPs, green fluorescing protein or fluorescing proteins. So the laser comes in uh, here, creates this evanescent field that sort of is a fixed part of the slide covering where we're looking and has this uh, exponential depth decay and then the signals reflected back and color and recorded. The, the challenge for us was that we were interested in this problem, but they need, they, it's really, the resolution here is now about 250 by 250 nanometers in plane and about 100 to 200 nanometers, 50 to 100 usually nanometers out of plane. It's a projection image of the fluorescing uh, uh, proteins. And the problem was, is we want to look at the cell, we wanted to track hundreds of vesicles and see how they were moving inside the cell. But we had a problem that the overall cell kind of sloshes around during, in a much slower way uh, during the acquisition process. So here's the endocytosis cartoon. This is the outer part of the cell, the plasma membrane. Here's the, one of these particles or vesicles impinging on the wall, invaginating the wall. It actually becomes a sort of a, a, a pit, they call it, a clathrin coated pit that's anchored to the wall initially and then later breaks away. Here's the slide. We'd like to track the cell through here, but we'd like to see it in three dimensions. So, and, and at least into about 500 nanometers or maybe up to a micron to see where it's trafficking to. The way we get, decided to do this is working with some of our optical uh, imaging folks actually in biomedical engineering and set up an idea to look at multiple angles that give us multiple depth projections 
take those multiple projections along with geometric and motion constraints and try to reconstruct both the vesicles and one other thing. So, and so the vesicles were, so four angles at a time are switched. We acquire four angles in order to try to capture the 250 nanometer per second motion, one uh, angle measurement every, every multi-angle measurement per second, and that's to look for the, at a certain wavelength for the clathrin vesicle traffic, trafficking. And then the, the plasma membrane and the cytoskeletal structure were stained at different colors, and that's the overall slower movement of the cell. So we could bring in a different color wave, different color lasers only once every, well, they move much slower. So maybe once every, uh, I don't know, whatever that is, like uh, several seconds, and, and do that all at once, and then try to correct the, uh, the global non-rigid motion. Here's the idea. If this is a, a trafficking vesicle moving one of the hundreds of moving vesicles, the overall red plasma membrane and the uh, r blue microtubules sort of move relative to that, and we want to correct those. Okay, so a lot of technology here. There's both optics involved, cell biology, image analysis. <clears throat> the first step was to calibrate the depths because there's a decay profile in each of these turf angles. So that was done by putting a known shape object, spherical bead in there, record the intensities, and basically you can ba back out these decay curves at different penetration depths D. So that's the first thing is getting these, uh, these curves F for calibration. Here's one of the multi-angle multi -angle images looking at the plasma membrane of the astrocyte cell. There's three of the different angles. So you, you see these projection images at different depths. And then using the calibration curves F and these different uh, uh, projection images and assuming statistical model of Poisson uh, statistics of the photon counts and just really using a likelihood term with these geometric, with these simple constraints on the, uh, the fact that we have the, both the image collection at four angles and the decay curve correction, try to estimate at each point we see a plasma membrane box, a pixel brightness, the true Z position from the four angles. So we're able to get the rough plasma membrane from this. The second step, and here's, a, a, I guess, one of the messages I wanted to leave you with before I finish, is that the, a lot of these ideas of image analysis can be applied at different scales. So the same basic algorithm and idea we looked at to track white matter pathways through um, diffusion weighted data with millimeter scale MRI, the same basic algorithm setting up point tracking and energy functions was used in the microtubule uh, uh, um, images from this turf microscopy at each, at each projection angle, setting up point-wise uh, uh, tracking over energy functions and minimal costs passed to then segment individual microtubules from each one of these uh, different projection angles. Same idea, this was just published in IEEE Transactions on Image Processing. Take four angles, segment the data, and set it up in an estimation problem. The energy function here is basically just the same idea. Find this true Z position having segmented vesicles and intensities in the images and a set of decay curves. The real take home message from all this is that the, the only geometric constraint is that as you reconstruct these microtubules in this small set of three-dimensional data, uh, you use curvilinear uh, sort of adjacency and sort of simple smoothing paths to try to get that. We're able to show that we could get pretty reasonable um, three-dimensional outputs. Uh, the only validation we've been able to do so far is to collect the microtubules we get from one of the from sets of cells and take uh, similar cells and look at them with electron microscopy, which is destructive, and sort of plot the statistics of the curvatures of the microtubules in similar regions, which looked plausible. The final part of this, and really this is all just to sort of talk about this work and show you where we're at, because it's all sort of work in progress, is to look at the, the individual pits and then track them. The idea here then is there's hundreds of these. That's what one of the one angle images looks like. And each of these sort of evolved through this process of, of invaginating the cell wall, getting a clathrin coating. Uh, we, then that's, what it's, uh, that's what's imaged and stained. Then there's this clathrin coated pit that's anchored to the wall. And then it breaks off and goes away as far as this imaging goes. So we wanted to at least track through this clathrin coated pit stage. 
This is set up as a state space nonlinear particle filtering problem. Basically ends up with just a likelihood term, sort of adherence to uh, a sort of does local maxima detection of the particles, very simple particle detection and segmentation algorithm, then passes it to the trajectory estimation, which is based on uh, yeah, this particle filtering idea, really just a state space motion model that in this case, looking for these pits, excuse me, tries to reward anchored Brownian motion sort of next to the plasma membrane looking for this vesicle moving around in a fixed region. So we, we simulated this by taking a bunch of particles, putting noise on it, and comparing it to one of the other algorithms in the literature. We, the key thing for our motion model so far is this idea that it's anchored Brownian motion near the initialization of the pit. Uh, Alternative algorithms tend to give longer lifetimes to the hundreds of trajectories that we tried to test both in simulated and real data because they don't, they, what happens is the particles skip in, the tra trajectory tracking skips into different particles and wrongly tries to connect them and makes the, the lifetimes too long. With our strategy in a better model, um, we're, and, and this whole idea of nonlinear particle filtering, we're able to get some pretty uh, better ideas now, initially in 2D, and now we're moving the whole thing to the three-dimensional tracking. So here's, here's one of the data sets. This is just using our algorithm, and you see that they don't move too much, but it, that's good, or that we're getting the right trajectories here, whereas the alternative algorithm is sort of when things come nearby each other, they tend to skip and wrongly connect the, uh, the particles. So work in progress, the three pieces are done, the membrane reconstruction, the microtubule reconstruction, and the initial 3D particle tracking. Now we have to put it all together and sort of look at it. And our goal is to look at different biologically manipulated cells uh, in a quantitative way over many cells and look at normal states and perhaps uh, wounded cells and maybe even look at virology ultimately. So. Um, we're through two sort of geometric models, some ideas on functional models related to both fMRI and then uh, microscopy analysis. The final thing I'd like to talk about is use of what I'll call physical models, really more biomechanically motivated models. A great problem for a biomedical engineering department. Um, we just hired Jay Humphrey, uh, I don't know if any of you work in the biomechanics area, a cardiovascular biomechanics person. I work sort of somewhat or somewhat closely with Andrew McCulloch at UCSD who really works in this area. Uh, and so the first application, I'll, or first area I'll talk about is cardiac work. And really there's a whole forward biomechanics modeling uh, research area uh, groups in these areas. So we wanted to try to take some simple forms of that to help guide our image analysis. And we, we've looked at different data sets, that, and I, I work closely with Al Sinousis, a cardiologist who has an animal physiology lab at Yale. And we've looked at different modalities. The initial one was simply uh, CINE uh, gradient echo um, MRI data. This is a dog heart where you're looking at the apex all the way up to the base of the heart. The donut here is the myocardium, the white inside is the blood pool. And so, uh, and, and then more recently, and this is sort of our main, uh, oh, that's interesting, how do we do that? Oh, there we go. Um, looking at uh, three-dimensional, actually four-dimensional ultrasound, this is one of the early ideas where you're looking up, here's the left ventricle, you're sort of looking at a rotated probe. But now we have a two-dimensional two array probe, it's a Philips IE33 machine for those of you that are interested, and we look out at a volume of information in the left ventricle. The idea is to first segment the endocardium and epicardium at all the time frames, and then mesh in between those using a meshing strategy and, and incorporate the biomechanics into this using a finite element strategy. Use some kind of, we use shape-based tracking at the, at the surfaces as driving functions or displacements. And ultimately what we're after, and this is sort of a chunk of, of tissue, if you will, reconstructed in the myocardium, we're looking at a map, a volumetric map of strains where it shows changes in displacement locally or basically a strain, uh, um, a, a strain plot that you can look at in different dimensions and try to analyze cardiac uh, mechanical performance. To go, for those of you that don't know, here's a cartoon, a cutaway cartoon of the heart and what we're really after. 
which is um, it's sort of a mid ventricle slice where you've got the, uh, the RB out here and the left, left ventricle here. This, um, but this region is perfused by the left anterior descending artery. As that becomes blocked or stenosed, it, um, it, it necroses the tissue first uh, towards the endocardium and then progresses out transmurally. So this is the progression of um, coronary artery disease or infarction. And what we'd like to see ultimately with these dense volumetric strain maps is a, a whole volumetric plot of the mechanical performance of the heart, perhaps radially, longitudinally, circumferentially, or even possibly along fiber directions. See how disease progresses and hopefully even see that if you feed uh, or unblock the artery with a stent or something, um, you can maybe see how that re recovers. Maybe it's all not re necrosed or the normal, somewhat normal function is returning. So uh, the first step, this is from not ultrasound, but MR on the left, I think, and CT, Cine CT on the right, segment these endocardial and epicardial surfaces. Uh, a lot of our, the work that's presented in this is based on the geometric models that I talked about at the beginning of this. The colors have to do now with um, local bending energy. Green is highly curved regions. This, some of the squares are the principal curvatures on these surfaces. White is pretty flat regions. Regions. And so we track this shape over the, uh, over the cardiac cycle from diastole to systole and back to diastole with the notion of trying to look locally on the surface for patches that on the next time frame have similarly shaped information within some plausible search region. That assigns a displacement vector and becomes the driving force on both the endocardium and the epicardium over the cardiac cycle and will then uh, incorporate that in the model as I'll show you in a second. But the, you can think of these as sort of needle maps of displacements as the heart beats that you're freezing the, the trajectories here and the heart's beating within them. But I mean you can take these and sort of drive what I'll show you as the model in a second. And in fact, here's how we uh, built this up. And it's, we're still working with this same basic idea. It's a little bit computationally expensive due to the, the, the finite element modeling. So we're looking at some alternatives, but it's the, still the basic same idea. Here's the endocardium, the epicardium for this heart. It's meshed. Uh, in addition, we've imposed canonical models, again from the biomechanics community, where they found that there's certain fiber coursing as you look transmurally across the heart and then uh, changes as you go from the apex to the base. And the idea is to then impose those constraints on the mesh. And in the end of the day, here's sort of a slab of this uh, heart. Take these um, displacements at the inner and outer boundaries and push or pull on that mesh model and they end up with something like that. But each of the nodes then are mechanically modeled with a material matrix, a pretty simple linear elastic material matrix, but biased along the fi knowing that the, the long fiber stiffness is about four times the cross fiber stiffness. So this whole notion of meshing, fiber directional coursing, and local material properties really just made up of Young's modulus and incompressibility constraints are all brought together and they become the interpolant to take the sparse displacements from shape-based matching of frame to frame and sort of uh, distribute it over the model and get out the these strains. And you can look at the strains in any canonical um, local space that you'd like. Uh, and um, really we solved the whole thing again as uh, basically a map estimation where you're trying to get from sparse displacements to dense displacements, try to adhere to the sparse displacements in a matching or likelihood term. And the model essentially becomes uh, this stiffness matrix that has embedded in it all the local material matrix properties. And so you can set it up as either displacement or strain. The bottom line is you're looking for a dense set of displacements or ultimately uh, epsilons or strains that match the sparse data weighted by confidence how well they match locally and then interpolated if you will or spread out by this material matrix C embedded in the stiffness matrix K uh, after some manipulation. Here's where we uh, went with this. Um, 
Here's a normal, you're look, taking the left ventricle, looking down the barrel of it, lopping off the apex and the base, and seeing how this heart, just in the radial direction, uh, stretches from diastole, the expanded state, to systole, the fully contracted state. And you see here, if you look out radially, that about 25% strain in all directions is what you're getting in this normal heart when you go from diastole to systole. Here's the same heart, this is a dog, one hour post uh, left anterior descending artery occlusion. You block the artery and you're looking at the same progression from uh, diastole to three frames later, five frames later, all the way up to the systolic state. And if you look in this, this region right in around here where we're expecting the bed of the LAD to feed, you're getting zero or negative strain, so it's not performing mechanically as well, and you have a, a volumetric map now of radial strain and looking where the, the performance is poor. So rather than sort of mapping it onto some canonical target, perhaps like a bullseye plot that's common in the cardiology world, you've got a real spatial map, hopefully, that mimics that particular heart and spreads out and looks at mechanical performance. We've looked at this in a variety of now more and more experiments. This was where we had six dogs where half of them were part way infarcted and the other half were fully infarcted. And some of the strain measures, this was now looking at principal strains, but the same idea really as radial circumferential and uh, was able to at least distinguish these in small data sets. Where this work is going is uh, we're now fully engaged in, in four-dimensional ultrasound. Uh, what you might have uh, realized that we only had displacement information at the boundaries with this shape tracking. We're collaborating with Matt O'Donnell at the University of Washington and Phillips, and we have a radio frequency readout board now, and Matt uses uh, um, the raw radio frequency data, both phase and uh, amplitude, for those of you in the ultrasound world, before envelope detection and B-mode formation, and uses the phase as a tracking mechanism, and it follows speckle patterns in the middle of the myocardium. So this is really nice. We can get mid-wall tracking and boundary tracking and put it all together. This is sort of a correlation map in part of the middle of the myocardium, and then you can just read out these uh, X, Y, Z, displacements and ultimately maybe uh, estimate material parameters from here as well. So we, we, our whole thing here is to estimate the surfaces S and the displacements U at the same time while incorporating both of these tracking methods, speckle and, and uh, shape. One last thing, though, is that we felt we were really just doing frame-to-frame -frame analysis, and I thought I'd throw this in as just one other idea that we've been looking at, which is looking at multi-frame information, also guided by a database. So um, I think it's within the last, well, different people have been looking at this, but there's, in the machine learning community, there's one idea, I think it was Dmitry Terzopoulos again that looked at it in looking at face recognition in ATM machines, or maybe others have done it as well, I don't know. But uh, the idea was to take a giant training set, in our case it would be uh, uh, patients over 16 time frames over hundreds of points on an endocardial and epicardial surface and try to throw this into a database and use it as a training set so that we could take so many uh, frames of a test set, maybe the first n, the first five or something, project them into this database and bring back a, uh, an estimate for the next frame. So it would use multi-frame targeting or, or progression to help target the next segmentation or the next tracking. What was done here is this sorted, and, and this is what Dimitri did and others using multilinear analysis, was to um, sort this into uh, using tensor decomposition into intuitive subspaces. In his case, it was something, when the face recognition, I think it was lighting by expressions or something like that by, uh, mm, not sure what else, view, I think. And so here it's subjects by motion by landmarks. We could take these, project them into the database, and retrieve a variation of possible surfaces at this next time frame. And so the idea is to use multi-frame motion sort of trajectories and a prior database to help guide future analysis. And we did some early testing on this showing that the multi-frame prior idea worked better than just frame-to-frame -frame matching by at least some sort of strain error metric on several data sets. Oh, against, uh, sorry, against implanted gold markers that we were able to see. 
So the final piece here is that the, uh, I thought that I'd, I'd mention that these same biomechanics models could be useful in other applications. And one place we've used them is in trying to correct for inaccuracies when doing image-guided neurosurgery. Here there's a problem where preoperative data sets are acquired. This is for epilepsy surgery. And uh, there's anatomical MRI, uh, functional MRI, and even MR spectroscopy. And the goal is to then go up in the, so find facial features here. You can't do this at the moment, for sure, during surgery. So you do all this complicated imaging ahead of time. Find the facial features from the anatomical image that brings all of it together. Go up into the operating room with either Medtronic or brain lab uh, system and find uh, sort of features of the face and then match the two data sets. Now wherever you go with, a, with an instrument, you can track it and relate it to the preoperative data sets. In this epilepsy surgery, they do two surgeries. One is a 10 centimeter craniotomy, remove the whole uh, part of the cranium, cut through the dura and place uh, intraoperative or intracranial electrodes waiting for seizures to happen. And based on this electrical information then, to stop these seizures in, very, uh, in patients that have very severe incidents of them, they actually resect this sort of size, couple centimeter pieces of tissue. But there's a problem in these surgeries in that the whole registration system's thrown off once that skull cap is removed because there's a loss of cerebral spinal fluid and the brain tends to deform inside the skull and so it's, it's thought of as being in the original state and there's no way unless you have an intraoperative MR scanner which is coming but still very expensive and not there yet. So what we had was the idea to sort of apply what I would call some something like computer vision mixed with medical image analysis techniques to look at this idea that after the craniotomy, if you look at this region here, there's a brain shift that could go on up to one centimeter. The, the markers go below the brain. And what we did was place two um, just stereo cameras up in the OR on, a, on the boom on the image guidance system segment, uh, image and segment the brain from the anatomical preoperative data, and then look at the opening with these cameras, realizing that the surface was going to deform over the course of the surgery, over minutes, it was really over tens of minutes, it was going to deform about a centimeter or even sometimes more. And then the idea then, uh, we would mesh the, uh, the brain, there actually was a literature on getting the Young's modulus of brain tissue, not sure how they got that, but there was some literature forward literature on it, and we could again impose this as least rough constraints and then try to deform the underlying tissue and bring along all the, uh, the, the measurements. So, um, so we, we, anyway, we put this all together with the, um, uh, with, so we, we went through of segmenting and then meshing and then using uh, actually uh, the camera-based surface estimates to, to uh, estimate displacements and at the end of the day could get model-based uh, deformations like you're seeing on the bottom there. And we had some data from Harvard who had is now a decommissioned intraoperative double donut magnet to look at the same thing to try to get uh, validation and approximations. So um, back to the brain deformation though, we set it up as this problem of trying to estimate camera calibration parameters and displacements at the same time, match the preoperative information and update the whole process. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I did some early work uh, on using, uh, just looking for different reasoning strategies beyond optimization and map estimation alone uh, back a while using, borrowing from the economics literature on non-cooperative game theory. So one of my students got enthralled with this uh, and sort of applied it here. I'm not sure it had to be applied, but I really liked the results. So it was trying to treat these as two separate modules of displacement field estimation and from sulci and deforming uh, uh, information from the cameras and then simultaneously calibrating the cameras and it plays them back and forth in this game to find a, a rational decision point. 
And at the end of the day, if something like this happens from the sulci and the intensities, you can sort of match up the cameras, calibrate them, and get this uh, sort of change on that surface patch in and around the exposed region. We're able to show that over, uh, with markers, at least on the surface, we could get from tens of uh, centimeters of, of, of brain shift back down to corrected appropriate information, at least at the surface. And uh, did this on, I don't know, I guess it was up to about 20 brains using, working with the neurosurgeons, and it came out pretty well. We were able to get it down to pretty small uh, uh, values, at least by the markers. Physical based models useful all over the place, these sort of mesh based models. We're looking at some other things and I'd like to ultimately put together mechanics and uh, electrical information in the brain and the heart with some of these meshes and sort of put things together. So we're looking at that. Other ideas in radiation treatment planning where these biomechanical tissue meshes might be used to correct for certain deformations and bring along treatment plans. And there's another whole project on that, but I won't, uh, won't take the time to, to talk about it. So um, I walked you through some ideas of using different kinds of models to constrain recovery of quantitative information from biomedical images, medical and some biological images. I think there's plenty of remaining challenges in this field. Still, we, a lot of what we're doing in modeling things is modeling normal structure. We still need to look at modeling abnormality, both functionally and structurally. These are going to end up in being mixture distributions, and we need to learn how to deal with this. Um, I'd like to see us cut across anatomical scales. I think this is a, a challenge for biomedical engineering in general. There's a lot of talk of systems biology. Imaging can be one place where this conduit could happen. If you can image things at hundreds of microns with optical, or even you know, microns, and then look at hundreds of microns of collections of cells and then pass it up into the bottom of what you might see with mouse imaging and MR, maybe we can cross models across scales, and that would be an interesting idea. I think it's a, it's a challenge, but imaging can be one conduit for that, for sure. As we do this work, we continually need to make sure we're getting the optics the physics of MR image acquisition, all kinds of things into the models, make sure we're accurate about that. My, my thing that I've tried to do over the years is I'm not always the one that gives you the best sort of driving it all the way to completion in the application, but uh, hopefully some seeding some ideas that have been helpful to the field. And I'd like to, as I get older, look for places where we can find things that cut across applications. And I feel that biomedical image analysis is its own field. That, and there's some core technologies that really we work on and have driven things like statistical shape analysis. Not the only ones doing it, but I think we've driven some interesting ideas there. And looking at basic algorithmic principles of sort of modeling and bringing uh, information together for uh, finding things in these very challenging and interesting data sets. And then finally, of course, never ending validation and evaluation. We need to continue to do it, find creative strategies, move from phantoms to animals to humans probably to uh, get at this information. All this work goes on with multidisciplinary teams in these different areas. These are folks, everything from MR physicist Todd Constable to uh, child psychiatrist Bob Schultz to Al Sinousis and uh, cardiologist Dennis Spencer and a uh, neurosurgeon. And I thank them and NIH support for do, being able to do all this from our uh, funding agencies tend to go to National Institutes of Health. And then finally, a lot of these ideas, we've, Xenios Papadimitris, my uh, colleague, um, has developed a website and, a, and a, really a software package of trying to put this stuff together so our local people, collaborators can use it. And it's uh, open source and on the web, so you might take a look at this bioimagesuite.org. Thanks to Oxford, thanks to uh, Medtronic, and uh, I enjoy being here. Hope you found something interesting. <laughs>
waiting to go out and, and uh, partake of the food and drink outside this auditorium. Um, Alison started with a statement in her introduction, Jim, saying that um, you're one of the pioneers in the field of uh, biomedical image analysis, taking it from a very immature subject to the status it has now. Now, we all work with medics here in the Institute of Biomedical Engineering, and we all know that medicine is evidence-based. And I think everybody will agree with me that uh, in the last hour or so, you've pre presented us with the evidence as to why Alison's statement was entirely true. Um, you've talked to us about uh, multimodal. Uh, in other words, uh, there was MRI, functional MRI, ultrasound, new forms of imaging. Uh, multi-model, uh, in that there were physical models, there were geometric models, um, multi-scale, we went from the cell all the way to the whole organ, uh, the brain um, uh, or, or the heart. Uh, and so in this um, rapid tour d'horizon from your lab, um, you have uh, given us uh, uh, all the evidence that we need uh, to uh, agree with Alison's original statement. Um, like the rest of the audience, very grateful to you for doing so in a uh, very interesting, uh, very thought-provoking um, and uh, at times a uh, challenging way. And I, I hope that we have time, as many of us as possible, to uh, go and challenge you about some of these results, uh, discuss them with you, uh, not over drinks, uh, but uh, in the future as well on future visits. But for, the moment, for the moment, I'd like to offer on behalf of the whole of the audience here and the Institute of Biomedical Engineering, our uh, heartfelt thanks for coming from Yale to give us such an interesting lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very cool. Thank you. Okay.